So it is my task to kind of get us started with this with this Q and A. So what I'd like to do is actually to put kind of some opening questions for Isiar around Yuli, which I hope. Uh, all of you have seen, if not, hopefully in the in the kind of context of this event, uh, but if not, perhaps in other context. I think it's, it's a fantastic film to be examining in in in, in relation to mobility, in, in relation to displacement and migration. I also would like to say that personally, I'm absolutely thrilled to be meeting to be meeting Ithier in this context. I mean, one of my heroes, my film heroes, I would say, for somebody like me, like uh, Dalila very kindly has mentioned kind of what the topics I research on in the introduction. But I also been teaching really steadily um, contemporary Spanish cinema for over ten years at Kings and Ithier's films are always there in my modules because they never cease to be contemporary, whether it's um, Take My Eyes, whether it is actually even The Rain, Tambien La Lluvia, whether it is kind of the, her more recent work. Um, the students, is, is a body of work that the students find incredibly engaging because of the themes I mean she deals with in her work and also because of the kind of formal challenges, the work with actors, the immediacy of many of the concerns of the films and how they put in cinematic terms. So for me it's an absolutely kind of thrill and pleasure to be actually meeting and, and engaging in this conversation with Thea. I wonder, I wonder if Thea, if we could start um, by, by you talking a little bit to this general idea of mobility and in particular this <laughs> place. It's my pleasure. Sorry, um, and also how, how the themes of uh, displacement and migration you think play have played a role in your choice of projects and also as a point of entry into your approach to visual storytelling. And I'm thinking of course here about Yuli and your work, I mean, or your collaboration with Paul Laverty, but also the work of adapting Carlos Acosta's memoir, No Way Home. Is this a, 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 it's kind of a topic that interests you in particular in relation to this project? We can't hear you very well. Is it me? Or is it? All of us. If oh, you prefer, yeah. Isiar, you can maybe yeah. switch off your camera. Perhaps we can ask the audience uh, whether they've seen the, they've seen Julie. Uh, in the context of the event, did they watch it online yesterday or they watched it earlier? And any comments or reactions? I have. <laughs> Excellent. Hi, Belen. Hi. I saw it yesterday, yes. And uh, I was really blown away by it. And to be honest, I didn't know her work. And um, I think that for me, it was really beautiful, really precisely to talk about uh, uh, mobility. And um, and I really was uh, I'm really keen to understand uh, uh, how she manages uh, through very few words and very specific shot to transmit that sort of sense of uh, migration and displacement and uh, movement that she did in uh, in uh, some of the moments of the film. Hi, Thea, can you hear us? Really sorry. Yes, suddenly just disappeared. The whole thing disappeared. Um, okay. So, so I'm in my mobile, and I think I'm I'm gonna be able to do it from here. So let's let's try. Good. It's much better quality of sound now. Okay. Great. <clears throat> so you were asking how I progress. get in. You 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 said how 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 I got into the. Into, oh my God! Now it's the computer here annoying me. <laughs> oh my God! Now it's the computer. I think I'm fine now. So you were asking if uh, how I got into Julie, the Julie's project, didn't you? Uh, yes, I mean about particularly about the themes of displacement and migration, whether this played a part in your interest in the project, and whether this was a challenge for you in terms of taking it to the screen in, in your own terms, in terms of yes, I mean, storytelling. I mean, Carlos Acosta's story is amazing, and obviously when you approach a story, everyone approaches from different places, and I think Paul's approach was probably the race thing going on through mm -hmm. the whole story and how this young young um, kid from a poor area in Havana being black managed to get through and end up being one of the best dancers or probably the best dancer in his generation. But I also saw this other thing you're mentioning which is Carlos Acosta left Cuba when he was like well first first he went to Lausanne to dance 
uh, to dance in this in this contest and then to mm -hmm. Italy. But basically, he started doing his own life when he was like 18, 19 in London. And to me, that was absolutely fascinating because coming from Cuba, which was, it still is, but then even a more in a more radical way, a communist country, it was literally like landing out from Mars in London because he didn't even know how a bank account worked. Or, I mean, there's, there was nothing connected to the life he was. And I've always, I've always been fascinated by people who land in another culture and get through it and how you deal with your longing and with your homesickness and how you communicate because it's not only the language, it's also all the cultural codes that are different. I'm now living in the UK for the last nine years and I still put my foot in nearly every day. <laughs> no matter if I speak fluently, I still don't get the codes. You know? yeah. So I think that's always been fascinating for me, apart from many other reasons to do Carlos Acosta story, but that was something I, I really liked. And Paul didn't put a lot of interest in that. There is some of that, but uh, but in the book is, is, is part of that. Anyway, it was someone uprooted and sent away and trying to survive in a different environment with so much talent to give, but also you have to, well, you have to thrive in a, in a different culture. And I guess it's a theme all over my films because I, I've always been fascinated by that, by the need of moving out and then how you deal with it, how you, how you, which I think is generally talking very enriching and very, a very rich experience, but sometimes it can be very lonely and, and, and also it can be this, this thing that everyone who's um, an immigrant feels like is in between two worlds that you are not um, completely 100% in both, in, 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 in neither. But I think I think in the in the balance I think is a is a positive. I mean I think you gain much more and and also you give a lot by being in so, in, in another place. Absolutely, and in that respect, it's interesting because the film that most that Yuli reminds me most uh, of is, is actually *En Tierra Extraña* in a strange land, which is completely different. It's a smaller scale. It's a documentary. It's set in Edinburgh. It's looking at those ideas of Spaniards living in Edinburgh and precisely feeling displaced. But did you find that kind of the themes resonate in the same way? Did you actually go to the book also as a guide? Did you talk to Carlos Acosta? But did, did Carlos Acosta actually talk with Paul and yourself about ways yeah. of points of entry into his own story? Yeah, there was a first, a first interview, which was a must. I mean, when you are gonna tell the story of someone's life, the first thing you have to do is meet in the person and see if there is points in common and, and if you trust each other and these basic things to start yeah. the trip. So Paul did that and then he came back very, very excited, thinking he was a very straightforward man. And then he talked about many things, not only about his life, but many other things. So, and then the next thing was very, uh, very strong for both. We went to Havana um, to see him. He was then in, in Havana with his company rehearsing something. And the, we were both mesmerized by those dancers and the beauty of just seeing them up close and the, 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 the talent and the, and, the, and the emotions they could communicate with the bodies. And so it was really amazing. And Paul instantly thought, let's put that in the film. Mm -hmm. Let's have, and then he, cre he created this structure in which it's a device to do the story, but it's like, he is doing this play on his life, dancing his life and all that. Um, we, we went through the book, obviously, and, and also we talked with the who's left of the family, which is the sister. Marilyn is the only one mm -hmm. who's left alive. We met, we met his master, his, his teacher, which is this amazing woman uh, mm -hmm. who's still alive and still teaching and still working hard to bring, bring all sorts of kids to the school in Cuba. She, she deserves a film in herself, I have to say. So we try to make a, when you approach someone, you have to try and make a picture of a person from, from as many sides as possible. Mm -hmm. And this is what we did. We went to his neighborhood, which was exactly the same. We went with him. And we saw him, he was very down to earth. He was saying hello to the entire neighborhood, knew them by name because he's, he's been back regularly there. So, uh, so, so all that conformed. And then Paul probably just tried to grasp the spirit of Carlos's relationship with the dad and, and all that. And, 
and, and not being that close to the every event because that's what biopics are sometimes a bit, they can be a little bit boring because they kind of go event after event. You have to kind of find um, a structure that's which true. is attractive in itself. And this is why we, we, we try this structure of dancing and, and past and present. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and the structure of five dance numbers, which are actually biographical in a very open-ended way, is, is really, I would say, one of the most beautiful and engaging features of a film that is very engaging in itself, precisely because of that story. How easy or how difficult did you find to catch the different aspects? Because there's a personal aspect, which is very highlighted. I mean, when the old section, when, when kind of Carlos Acosta is in London, actually he's always drawn back to Cuba. I mean, you don't see much of his life as an adult working in London, for instance, as a member of the English ballet. He's always drawn back. And obviously his personal memories do have social and political resonance. How difficult or how easy it was to find the adequate way of kind of bring these things into, into the line of storytelling? Yeah, in the book, there were a long, a lot of the book was his his professional life in London mm -hmm. and in and in um, in the states, but probably uh, what fascinated Paul more was his childhood because it it kind of marked her, her, his whole experience and also the relationship with the dad, which was very strong. The book is dedicated to the dad, and 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 mm -hmm. and he wrote the book. He said to come to terms with his dad. So there is a big theme there. So in, in a life's person, you have to choose what line, what spine you're gonna work from. Otherwise, you... so, so that was, that's what Paul kind of did. And then it's amazing because Carlos's life covers the 40 last years of the life in the island. Yes. And, and, and his family events are, are very connected to very big important events in the life of Cuba. So people are not in a vacuum. And then Carlos happened to be right at the heart of very strong moments, mm -hmm. like, a, like this moment in which in the, in the early 80s when, when families split, because there is this people, many people going to Miami, many people, and that happened within Carlos' family. And then he came back right at the, at the, at the worst of the crisis in the early 90s when, when, the, when the special period started and the rats were trying to get to Miami and all that. And he was right there back, wanting to be back. And then all his mates wanted to be out. So, so it's, it's just, his life was marked by the events the island went through. So it was kind of easy to bring them in. Then you, you, you can put more or less attention to that. But I, I, we both thought, Paul and me, that was fascinating. And, <clears throat> and also because Carlos's life and Carlos's dance, it could only happen in Cuba, really. Uh, I mean, a kid like that wouldn't have learned to dance in another country, uh, which is not Cuba. And then you have to kind of give a sense of what the island was, and at least a sense is much more complex, and you can add there hundreds of experiences, and we are just telling one. But, um, but it was important to have Cuba there because it meant a lot to him. He never forgot it. He was always drawn to Cuba. He never spoke badly, he uh, has never to the date spoke badly about, about anything. I mean, he was always connected to Cuba in a very personal way. Mm -hmm. His company was created there when he, when he stopped dancing for the, for the Royal Ballet. He could have done a company probably anywhere and probably in London, he would have had lots of doors open and then he decided to do it there. So he's not invented his connection with Cuba is super strong. So, uh, so, so all that was there and we just, we just, pay the attention to it because it was there. Yeah, absolutely. But in a way you also managed to find the points of conflict that make for an interesting film, an interesting friction film. And in particular, you chose the relationship with the father as the backbone of, of the film, right? Did you feel yeah, that yeah. that was the most productive, the most interesting uh, way to go down this, his particular story? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, when you have a writer like Paul, it's not you can tell him go this other yeah. way because he's going to go where he's Absolutely, yes. And mm -hmm. I just found it, I, I just found it amazing. I don't know if I had done the adoption, if I would have paid more attention to other things. Okay. But I don't, but I mean, it didn't even occur to me. Um, I think he did an amazing job, Paul, with adoption because it's very, very difficult. I did an adoption 
um, before that, on a, on a, on a, on trying to cover a lot of a life of a woman, and it was very hard. And I don't think I did a very good job, you know. So it's, it's I know, I know it's, it's a very difficult thing. So to choose that was, first of all, choosing probably the most important event for for Carlos, which was his relationship with his dad. As I tell you, is the book is dedicated to him, and his whole entire life was was connected to his dad, classing and non-classing, but, but that was there. And then also it brought all this race thing, which is something which has been in Cuba all the time, but yes. not, not being very official. That was a very strong experience when we brought the film back to the film festival in Havana. And we had in, the, in, this, in this theater, which is the Karl Marx with Holmes, I think it's like 5,000 people, it's amazing. So there were lots of black people there and they were in awe because you don't talk about racism openly in Cuba. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's going on culturally, but officially it's, it's not a theme. So, so I think Paul was right in tapping into that because the father was like that and the relationship was like that. And probably because Carlos' career was marked, marked like that and it made him, I mean, it was such a milestone to be Romeo. And, and he got criticism too. So, so, uh, so it's, it was a milestone for a dancer like him to be the prince, the beautiful prince, the European beautiful prince. So, so it makes all the sense to go for those, those things because it's what, I mean, what made Carlos' life remarkable is he was such an amazing dancer. But when you go back to his life, you think, oh, wow. I mean, mm-hmm. he came from a very, very hard background mm-hmm. and he made it. Absolutely. And I, and I think, I mean, that reflection on racial politics and success and individual success, but also re- the relationships that are mediated, I mean, um, through racial politics is one, is one of the aspects that makes the, the film, even, you know, a few years down the line, particularly relevant and particularly urgent to think about uh, biographies, to think about um, uh, the whole... Um, issue of, of telling a life story in a genre that is actually given historically more preeminence to white male subjects uh, of European extraction rather than looking on other transnational kinds of narratives like the one you offer here about um, and different kinds of subjects. So, so the, the film definitely does, does a lot of that work that, and is incredibly relevant. Um, at this point, I think uh, definitely we should uh, open up the floor for comments and questions to ECR. Uh, English or Spanish is fine, and we'll translate if, if need be. So do not be shy. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question, um, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, uh, because I thought the film was fantastic. I, I, it was so sensitive in many, many ways. Um, and um, particularly things like, I mean, we've spoken a bit just now, you've spoken about the hardships and, and the background, uh, the background to life in Cuba and, and the hardship of decades of um, the embargo um, and, and then, you know, the way that people have dealt with that. Um, and, and also um, a, a lot about the personal choices which um, Carlos makes, uh, how hard they are, um, the closeness of his family, which I think is very much of a Cuban thing and many other places, but it, you know, it, it really comes over. But here's, here's my question, because there's quite a big thing about health in, in the story. Um, which you cover, and health is a very big thing in Cuba. Uh, it's something that's very much recognized outside of Cuba. Uh, um, mental health included. Um, and if you think about, well, uh, uh, Cuba is known for sending doctors and so on um, missions abroad. But if you think particularly about um, the children who came over from after the Chernobyl disaster, who were given treatment and an education, you know that that is so much um, a part of migration. What you know, what was it like for those children to <laughs> be plucked up from where they were and uh, and put in a different society? But I, I just wonder. Here's my question: um, um, Given 
given that there that Cuba is so good on health, there is a lot of treatment. I just wondered. It, it, it sort of seemed like there was the mother who was sick, and you didn't know how she was being treated, and and the tragedy with the sister. Um, I just wondered if you, if you, what you thought about that whole question of um, that part of society and and what it meant to Carlos and in his life story. Um, <clears throat> well, I think it, it it made him worry all his life. Um, and probably traumatized. There was a there was an image he tells in his book, and he told us, um, but it's not in the film. When one day he came back to the neighborhood and saw uh, an ambulance outside his house, and his heart just stopped because he absolutely adored his mom. And then that meant. I mean, the story of the mom is is pretty terrible. She was taken. She had an ictus, uh, a stroke, and then she was taken to hospital. She was paralyzed. Then she came back. Um, Carlos family in the film they have a house with a little patio but in reality it was an absolute tiny house in a tiny apartment no patio it was literally I mean I don't know how many meters but it was just so we thought for a moment in shooting there but it was just impossible we couldn't fit in so uh, so they were in very basic very basic conditions I don't know I mean Carlos doesn't go into much detail about how all that was. Uh, obviously, they have treatment. Obviously, the mother was treated in hospital. Uh, but then with a stroke or with a schizophrenia, there or here, there is not that much you can do sometimes. So I, I don't know. Um, he, doesn't go, he doesn't go into much detail. Uh, and, uh, and there was a moment in which we thought to, to have some hospitals or to have the sister in a hospital. Uh, but then, I mean, you have to choose. Really, you have to you have to fight your, pick up your battles because otherwise you are you just get lost a bit in the, in so many things. So we never went much into it. But I agree with you that the, there is a whole area there in Cuba. The film celebrates talent and celebrates uh, celebrates um, the 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 world of art, which in Cuba is this is dance, but there is music and there is film and there is painting. And there is amazing architecture. So, I mean, it's a really talented place. And the film celebrates um, a dance in this case. But, um, but you could go and tell stories there. That I knew about these, these Chernobyl kids that went there. And recently, there were other girls. I mean, it is amazing. The effort, uh, the effort they've done internationally to, with, uh, with, the, with their medicine. And they now have a vaccine, uh, but they don't have the jacks to, to give them, as far as I know. So. Um, so, I mean, there's so many stories you can cover and you can tell. Hi, can I come in? Yes. Do yeah, please. fantastic. Yeah. yeah, we were just saying, yeah, when you were on, when you froze, what a, ex how exciting this is for us. Because a lot of us teach your films and it's, it's you know, uh, I'm a big fan. So, it's, yeah, I just wanted to get thanks, that in. Thanks for using them. Thanks for, for yeah. them in the world. That's fantastic. Absolutely. We teach, we show our students um Te doy mis ojos and también la lluvia and it, you know they they really engage the students and and create so much debate so yeah anyway just that's my little fan moment um <laughs> I watched the film yesterday quite tired so I'd need to I don't have anything particularly clever to say but one thing I found quite interesting was the the way the film treats Cuban politics and particularly you know Paul Laverty who's a very political screenwriter uh, and I found that quite curiously it's sort of almost the, the absence of a position on Cuban politics and the higher echelons of the the kind of system so you know we've said that that Carlos had this incredible opportunity as a working class black boy to nurture his talent but then there's also this implied message that he had to leave to have a full a full career and yeah. there was a kind of hint that that might have been controversial that he went to London, but I was curious in the sort of absence of position taken to the Cuban regime and Fidel's regime. And, and I just wanted to ask you about that, if that was a, a deliberate approach. Well, Carlos doesn't go much into that uh, personally. He's, uh, he's, um, he has navigated all that uh, um, in a very, um, I mean, there is something here. I mean, so many, so many sports people and artists just flee Cuba, you know, and they used um, 
either an international competition or, um, or, a, or a tournée with their dance companies to just stay. They, they did that so many times and actually that was part of the impoverishing of their sports and arts because people just were leaving. So Carlos never did that. Um, Carlos left with a permission and because he wanted to be sure he could be back. If you left that way, you were kind of punished and then, and then you might come back but not live again because it was all very controlled every, and they know who come in and out. They also obviously knew who was bad mouthing the regime outside. So for different reasons, and also because probably he's grateful to what he was given, he never had entered into discussing. No, 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 no I'm not gonna say criticism, just simply discussing it. He never did. So it, did, it didn't, didn't really was a place to go and discuss that. I mean, I never felt, um, and then he didn't have, a, I mean, he had the permission from Alicia Alonso, but the relationship in the book is, is very well told. He was humiliated when he came back from London. He was put in the very low scale of, of the dance company when he had been already uh, a first dancer, he was put down. So there was a racism going on there. And he tells that in the book. But we never tell the part in which Carlos tries to have a life in, in, we just skip that quickly because we wanted to get into other things. I mean, this is the thing, you have to choose. But he did, he did work for the national company, which he belonged, they study and then they belong to the national company. And he wasn't well treated there. And it's well known that Alicia Alonso was pretty racist with, with black dancers. Uh, but again, she was alive then and he didn't want to make an issue of it. And so he just passed through it, uh, you kind of read in between the lines that, but still, and he underlines that, she gave him the permission to leave, which, which was key for him, because otherwise he wouldn't have been able to go back and forward to visit his family. So we kind of have respect his, uh, his way of, of, um, of portraying or talking about, about that. I think you can, you can see in the film some of that because the, the teacher says, you're not gonna do anything in Cuba, you have to leave. She gives the example of another black dancer who couldn't make a career. So that's straightforward, said there. Um, and then you see the crisis and you see people desperate to live. Um, and, then, and then we are telling a private life, but all, all those things, all those things are there. You could go much more into it, definitely. But, but since he doesn't, and since it's just a glimpse of it there, um, it's just the way it's told. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, it's an interesting question because it kind of takes us through into the whole question of the politics of home and the politics of belonging, how it's never only a personal issue, but all these layers are there. And I was wondering because one of the dance interviews, one of the episodes in the in the dance show actually is, is a political episode with this character general is Medley D. Butler. Mm -hmm. And it's about American intervention. Another character asks Carlos, well, what does this have to do with your life? And the question is not answered, but that interlude is there and is a very pointedly intervention, isn't it? It's very funny because this is a dance uh, obviously Paul invented. Yes. And General Smithley, General Smithley participated, as he says in the text, he participated in most of the operations, uh, illegal operations of the states to, to protect American interests. So that is a statement. I mean, that dance is a very strong statement. And the thing is, you cannot look at Cuba isolated. Cuba is a, in a geopolitical map in which, I mean, the states have played a huge part and still do today. Still there is an embargo still so so i mean to think in cuba as a vacuum again is is but and, and then paul introduces that dance introduced smithley which became a pacifist at the end of his life denouncing what he's been doing uh, and then he does the dance and then, and then the thing is someone asks and then carlos does this kind of ironic it's like well keep asking because th that's what he's hinting it's like well you cannot um, um, we are what we are because of the states and so many other things. So, uh, so that's that's a kind of a statement. Yeah, this times, but there's a vivid. I mean, it's a vivid, cryptic. But if you listen to what Smithley says, 
is just a, it's just it's, it's, it has a book which says what is racket or what is a racket mm -hmm. and and he calls himself a racketeer mm -hmm. and he says that is um, that, the, that that these all these wars were done for profit mm -hmm. absolutely so there's um, a question from uh, someone uh, called Wesa. yes andres do you want to come in yes that's me thanks Elena. Uh, thanks, Ithia, for being here today. I'm also a big fan as a person coming from Spain. I mean, I literally like, grew up, grown up with your film, so it's great to have the chance to discuss them with you. And I wanted to uh, follow on Deborah's question about the issue of Cuba, because I remember when I watched the film, having this sense of it being from a like, British uh, screenwriter and a Spanish director, but having this essence of Cuban cinema somehow, and this certain joy and, and depth in, in political terms sometimes that Cuban film has. So my question would be whether you watched any Cuban films in order to like prepare for the film and whether there were like very clear references for you or you just build the story from somewhere else. Well, I've, I've been in Cuba many times before the shoot of the film, never as long, because when we shoot the film in the altogether was four months, and then previously I did a few trips too. But uh, the first time I went to Cuba was in actually in 91, uh, when they were starting the and I, I was traveling around just, just because I wanted to make, make, make know the place. And then I, I went there several times. Uh, the writer is saying hello. <laughs> so uh, no, anyway, so um, so I knew a bit of Cuba. I knew I knew people there. I have seen their cinematography, which is fantastic, because because lots of the films in Cuba were open in Spain, and we even share some stars. Some stars played in in in, in Cuba and Cuban cinematography, and likewise, Cubans like uh, Peru Guaria have been have been working in Spain a lot. So I knew I have my own knowledge of Cuba. And then, and then the thing is, um, I mean, this wasn't going to be a film to, to criticize Cuba. It, it, it was never going to be like that, because that's not Carlos's approach. And, and, and I don't know, we are, to, we are talking about something different. I mean, you have, to, you have to make points. You have to show there is big contradictions, because they are. And when you are there, you feel lots of contradictions. You feel, I mean, you feel the embargo, but you also feel that the government has a very strong hand on things that you wish they wouldn't. Uh, and there is a very heavy, heavy state hand on people. And, and there, is a, there is an economic a crisis going on forever. And people endure, I mean, the patience they have, you know, now, now it bursts out and then people complain, but it's been, it's been so many years of hardship. So, so you have all these contradictions, but, but, but you also see the effort they are making in some of the other, many other areas like health, like education. I mean, it's been, for many years, it's been an example in the middle of Latin America for, 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 a, for a better society, for a more equal society with all the weight of the state. So, so but it's, I mean, you could, do, you could do so many films in Cuba tapping into the different things and you, you really have to choose what are you gonna talk about. So we wanted to have a glimpse of the contradictions and also the, the, the positives of it, and then tell a, person, tell a personal story that, that, uh, that told about more universal things. So that was what we tried to achieve. And also tell it through dance sometimes. So like, we have enough challenges, enough, enough in our plate. But, um, but yes, I mean, because I knew Cuba from different angles, all that probably is also in, in the, in the film. For example, I, one of my strongest experiences is seeing these very young girls with all their tourists. I mean, it was, it was so painful to watch, but like girls, 14, 16, 15 year old girls going out with much older tourists. Um, and it's in the film, it's a little glimpse of that and, 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 and Carlos complains about, no, the friend of Carlos complains about that. So to try to introduce things, but it's, it's is two hours of of film. It's not that many things you can you can add. If 
there isn't anybody else, I have a I have a question. I would like to jump in in the conversation because uh, uh, obviously dance has a prominent place, uh, and uh, the dance sequences are obviously one of the aspects that have more had more impact on me. The way you film them, and also the role that they have in the in the narrative, in the story, and how they evolve. And um, also, it kind of impacted me on how also you build this very complex uh, portrait of way of seeing also masculinity through dance, the masculine body. So it's very interesting also to me in that respect. So I would like to know a little bit more uh, on how you approach the dance scenes and also maybe some, I don't know, um, backstage aspects of how did you manage to make these actors, dancers moves and how was working with dancers as well. That was really beautiful. That was that was the probably the most, I mean, I love being there for so long because as I say, I have always been back and forward Cuba, but never really staying there for a while. So that was that was really, really, really good. And then the experience with the dancers was amazing. Um, <clears throat> well, Paul brought this scenes. He had this idea of, and then, and then this part of his life, we are going to dance it. And then he described more or less the choreography or what would, what would happen. But not much. And I remember when we were bringing the film to the BBC for a, for a pitch to defend the project. And they would go, so how this is going to look like? And I go, no idea. <laughs> and they were kind of shocked. And I go, I've never done this. I have never seen this either. Like some parts of a fiction film being told through dance. So this is it. We jump in or we don't. So we are going to try and jump in and do as best that we can. And that was actually a very beautiful part of it. So. For a moment, I thought that Carlos could be happy to choreograph those scenes. But then as soon as I meet him in London and he was up to here in a hundred things because he's an hyperactive man in a hundred pies, I thought, well, Carlos, I don't think you have time for this. Let's find someone we trust, a choreographer that knows you and that, uh, and that, can, and that can translate these scenes into, into dance. And then we did, we find uh, Maria Rovira, which is a Catalan choreographer who had actually worked in Cuba quite a few times. He knew his company. He had worked in the National Cuban Company. So he was very aware and very familiar with all. And then we sat down together with the dance. Well, we didn't sat. We actually, I, we went together down to La Habana in two trips, uh, two different trips, to try and choreograph those scenes. So it was fascinating because she was there trying to find the movements. And I was there because the, the, the main thing was, this is not abstract. Many times contemporary dance is pure abstract, it's pure beauty. And they are not really telling nothing very narrative. It's more like emotions or, 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 or just a celebration of beauty. But this had to tell things. This had to tell that he succeed in the States. This had to tell that he was alone in his, in his boarding school. So it did have to be narrative. So I was there too, because I, as the director of the film, those were scenes of the film. So she was putting up the choreographies and I was, I was there trying to tell her, okay, but this should communicate more of that. And then she would try to find the movements. And then I would say, that's fine, but why don't we try and communicate also such and such? And then she would try the movements. And then I came back with a, with a, with a, a rough choreographies to the musician, which is Alberto Iglesias, which is amazing. And he put music to that. And then I went back with that and the music and we polished the choreographies, Maria, with the dancers. So it was amazing. It was really beautiful, beautiful. And then it's, it's also funny because dance tends to be much longer. So a piece of two minutes, I mean, a film, scenes in films are two, three minutes long. A four or five minute scene is already very long. But a dance of two minutes, it's like, I was just coming in. I, I, I'm about to start. In two minutes, you do very little. <laughs> it was all like shrinking the movements. I was saying, no, 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 Maria, we have, to, we have to cut all that running up and down. Just go to the point, go to the point, because <laughs> we don't have the time. We don't have the time to. So it was a kind of a collective work, which, which was beautiful. And the dancers were fascinated, fascinated with actually telling something. And they loved it. It was a great experience for them. Because, because sometimes they also love to just be more dramatic and being telling something. 
So, uh, so it did work very, very well. It was hard work, but it was, it was very beautiful to be, to be doing that part. And then we just tried it in the editing room. You just bring it all and say how this is going to work. And you truly don't know. And then the first person that saw it liked it. And I thought, we made it. But I didn't know if we were going to make it. Because people go to see a film. And suddenly they start dancing. And it's a danger. They says, come on, I'm not in a contemporary dance show. I want to see actors. But we managed to just kind of intertwine it, and keep them short, keep them always on story. And I think even people who don't like dance they appreciate the, the, the pieces because they are, and, and these dancers are, I mean, they are first class dancers. They are amazing. Mm -hmm. oh. How to say, I mean, these are beautiful sequences, but also Carlos position as the dancer, as living through the dances, but also being a spectator to his own story. It creates a particular dynamics, doesn't it? Because in, in fact, I mean, kind of reminds me the way that art in your films sometimes produce this representation that leads to the to the characters realizing something. I remember Take My Eyes, the Doi Mas Ojos, where painting is absolutely key at certain moments to evoke certain understanding on the on, on the part of the of the protagonist. And I wonder if something similar was going on here in that process of understanding coming mm -hmm. to realize. I think for Carlos, uh, because <clears throat> as I say Carlos Carlos was very busy. He was super generous. He just let us be. So Paul wrote the story. And then when I came down to Havana to shoot, he, he never ever interfered in anything. He just gave us free, free light for everything. So when he arrived to do his part, it was at the end of the shoot. He hadn't seen anything. And he just arrived with, in the last week or so, 10 days, to do his, his part. Um, and I remember uh, when he was, the, we had the most, for a moment, we thought to have another dancer playing his dad. But suddenly we thought, wow, it would be amazing if Carlos plays his dad. And then we told him and he goes, that's a good idea. I don't think he thought it through. I think because he's it's just always on his feet and, 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 and fast and ready for the next thing. But when he came to do the scene of the beating, he hadn't rehearsed it very much. And, and he was very technical. No? See, was, so we, we were trying to figure out how to shoot it. And then it was a kind of a choreography also with the Steadicam because the, the Steadicam had to move with them so they didn't class. So, uh, so, so, so it had to do, it had to be. So they started all very technical and Carlos super technical, bang, bang. And then I go here and then I go there. And then we do one rehearsal and then a second one. And then we did a take and Carlos started like getting into it. And then the second take, he, it absolutely blew his mind. He just went into it. I think he went into his memory of what was, and, and that scene is in the film because, because it's, it's, it's in Carlos' mind forever. It's in the book that that was, he got lots of beatings from his dad, but this one, he thought he was gonna kill him. So I think there was a moment in which he really kind of entered in the memory and it was absolutely cathartic. I mean, the whole crew was on hold. His dancers were, you know, he finished and went to a corner and burst out crying and cried and cried. And, and I, I think it was just, a, just a burst of, of, it was a cathartic thing, probably confronting, leading. And I was thinking all the time, this is a very heavy scene for Carlos, but because he was so technical, I thought, well, maybe he manages to keep a distance, but obviously he couldn't, he just, he just went in and it was amazing. And you can see that when he's crying in the scene at the end and he hugs the other dancer, it's true. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. he's, in, a, he's in, a, in a trip with it. It was very, very powerful. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's that relieving that, putting himself in the place of the other, which is also very interesting in the place of the father. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it was a trip because it, yeah. was, it was playing his dad as he's shouting, he's remembering his dad shouting. So it's a, a kind of a, I, I don't know, something happened there because he, boom, he went into, into a very deep emotional thing. Absolutely. Just a one more technical question. Did you have to shoot a lot of coverage and then find the way of dealing with, with the numbers on the editing room? Or did you actually work so dance with the camera? No, no, we were so tight. I mean, the right thing, the right way to have done this would have been having two sets of dancers, mm -hmm. some for rehearsing and some to actual shoot. But we didn't have that. So this is why also I say the dancers were amazing. 
we did sometimes 20 takes of something and they danced the 20 takes. I mean, they ended up exhausted, but we couldn't, I mean, we, we, we couldn't do it all the way. And we have very little time for everything. So we were really tight, but they were so amazing. And they gave their souls to the thing. But yes, sometimes I thought, I wish we had someone to, because also for us, it meant, I mean, every take was not rehearsed. So, so it, when you're rehearsed, your movements are, are, are just fine to get what you want. But many times we just miss it because we couldn't rehearse. And then we had to ask them another take. And I was like, do we really have to do another take? And the cameraman would say, I missed it. So we had to do it again. But they, they were amazing. And I think, I mean, at least when we finished, they were, they were fascinated because they are artists and they are performers. And then it was like a different language. And they were fascinated with the camera, with the scene themselves, uh, how, how they look. Also, the lighting for the theater was done by our DOP, which is extraordinary. So they were fascinated too by the, by the atmosphere created by the lights. And so, I mean, I think it was very rewarding for everybody, but it was tight and it was hard. I mean, the cinematography by Alex Catalan is, is superb. It's, it's so immersive. So uh, it does work. Yeah, but I, I can imagine. Um, are there any more questions, comments? No comments. Comments? Comments? <laughs> Ask questions? I mean, we're almost at the end of the, of the hour, as promised. Um, just giving kind of looking at the list of people in case somebody kind of somebody's feeling shy this is your chance i don't want to jump in because i've already had one but um if no one else does anyone else want to come in? Do come in. I, no i just i was kind of curious about the whole sexuality element the fact that when carlos started dancing that he was called a maricon you know that he was called queer and I was curious to sort of how the film navigated that because it, there's no kind of overt denial, there's no pushback, he does it. And that's sort of a sign of his, I don't know, the strength of his father who kind of, uh, there was a kind of very interesting tension with the father who's this very macho guy and, and really encouraging his son to do something that the whole of his society sees as a kind of queer activity. Um, so I was just curious into how that, that is, that, is something, <clears throat> that is something, the man who plays his dad in the film is not an actor, by the way, he's a choreographer. He was a choreographer for the Tropicana Ballet for 20 or 30 years. He's an amazing man, a dancer first and, and, um, and a choreographer later. And, and he was actually a teacher of Carlos in school. So he, wa he was a fantastic man, full of stories and very, very, very bright and, and cultured. And he was gay. And he said, uh, and because he was playing Carlos Dad, he says, the most amazing thing about this whole story is how a man from that neighborhood and a, and a truck driver, which obviously was a macho man, as you say, was so keen on his son being a dancer, when culturally that was completely off. The, the wall, you know? So he says, th that man was remarkable. So the father, the father, the father probably knew Carlos was gay and he didn't care. Um, and he knew that that was a very strict and disciplinary place where that would keep him off the streets because that was what, what was worrying Carlos that, I mean, there were fights all day in, in that neighborhood. It's a, it's a very tough neighborhood. So, uh, so I think the father thought of Valet first as a way of keeping him away from trouble. And then he saw he had talent. But it's truly amazing that he, he pushed him into that direction. But Carlos wasn't gay, he, he never was. The, the book is full of his adventures and girlfriends and so. So there, there, that wasn't an issue ever. Um, but he had to, yeah, he had to overcome all these prejudices. But I, but, I, was, but I imagine that the ballet was a, a, a place that a lot of gay men did go into, even though Carlos wasn't gay, or, or is that a stereotype? No, not necessarily. Well, maybe, I don't know. I don't okay. know if there were many gays. In those days, being gay in Cuba, a very good, very good news. So, yeah. but it must have been because there is yeah. you know, usually, usually, but 
I don't think the no. <laughs> and I think, for example, in his company there was just one gay. The rest, the rest were straight. So I think there is also a myth about the gays in in mm-hmm. dance. Maybe because the most famous ones have been gay. But there the are story of the father was fascinating. That's really good yeah. to have the insight to that. Yeah, but yeah. I don't think it was an issue that, and the father never never worried about that, which is amazing. Yeah. Because it was in the neighborhood, but I think people feared him in the neighbor in the neighborhood. So he wouldn't have trouble to just punch someone if, if he knew. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of of him as a as a gay, it wasn't it wasn't a problem. But it's true that the story does play out with prejudices that are associated to working class cultures or to mm-hmm. race cultures, and and how in fact that bond is so complex between father and son and doesn't go in the direction that you think it's going it's going to go about yeah. the father say you know forbidding him to to dance actually he forced him country. to go and or, dance yeah yeah this is what was yeah it was the anti anti billy elliot i mean it was the yeah, contrary exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, this is what is amazing about this guy i mean he probably had this idea of of discipline but then he obviously had a sensitivity and he saw something in the sun and also he saw beyond the neighborhood and mm. thought, no, you have to get out. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it's very, a very remarkable figure. Yeah, very absolutely. hard. I mean, I think the, I have a funny feeling reading the book that the, the, the father was tougher, was, mm. was a tough cookie. And, and, and I think Santiago, the, the man who plays the father, is, 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 a, is a more humane man. He's, he's, a, softer, he's a softer soul. I think, I think Carlos' dad must have been very tough for what they say and for what is told in the book. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. I think uh, it's five past, so probably we, we should wrap it up here. Yes. Is that right, Talila? Yes. yes, yes. We should wrap up and... <laughs> Thank you very awesome. much. It's been a pleasure to be talking about all these things. Uh, no, it's been a pleasure to us. <laughs> I hope yeah, thank you for our Stay steady. I hope the, the internet worked fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After you connected with your phone, well, wow. perfectly. So yeah, thank you again. It was an amazing conversation. You've been very generous in sharing with us all these aspects of your work and how you approach such an amazing story from different perspectives. So thank you again for taking part in this Q&A and thank you also of all of you for coming and thank you Belen for hosting this conversation for your amazing comments. It's been really great and yeah, thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye, bye to all. Okay. Bye. Okay.